All right, uh, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Today, I am talking with Dr. Eric Trexler, and he is someone I wanted to have on on the podcast for a while, but ever since I've been listening to the Stronger by Science podcast, it became more and more obvious to me that he is a very great conversation partner, not just a smart person. So I knew that uh, I couldn't postpone the time when I would actually reach out to him. So I'm honored to have him on. So Eric, uh, thank you for taking the time today. And how are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Um, so can you just, um, I mean, you don't have to go into it at length, you know, probably 80% of the people that are going to listen to this podcast or watch the YouTube video will have clicked on it because they see your name. So it's not the case that people are tuning into this, not knowing who you are probably. Uh, but, um, yeah, just like in one or two sentences, what are the couple of bullet points that they should know about you? Yeah, so I am. Uh, I did my PhD in human movement science at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, a lot of my research pertained to dietary supplements. I did some research on bodybuilders and how their metabolic rate and just general, uh, I mean, you know, how their metabolic rate changes with uh, with contest preparation and recovery, but also how a number of hormones change and performance factors, things like that. Um, so after my PhD, I became the director of education at Stronger by Science with Greg Knuckles. And so at Stronger by Science, we have a coaching program that I'm in charge of, um, uh, where we, you know, help clients reach all sorts of fitness goals, bodybuilders, powerlifters, general population. We put out a lot of content on Stronger by Science, which includes, uh, um, our podcast that goes up every Thursday. And I also am one of the writers for Mass, which is a monthly research review. Um, so Mass comes out the first of every month, and we we go through and review usually about 10 of the most interesting, most useful studies that relate to exercise and nutrition. So that's what I do. Yeah, so you're living the dream of a fitness or lifting nerd, I guess. So props to you for all of those cool things that you get your hands on at the moment. And uh, just before the recording, I told you that I will try to make this interview interesting for you because um, we will be talking about a topic that you have covered in a lot of interviews before mine. Um, the three topics that I hear you talk about most commonly are creatine, caffeine, and then metabolic adaptation. Out of those three, which one would you say is the most uh, interesting one for you? You know, it kind of fluctuates uh, depending on... Uh, just whatever is piquing my interest at the moment. I mean, all three aspects are constantly changing and evolving. Um, and at certain times, you kind of follow one until you get sick of it. And then, and then you shift your focus to something else for a little bit. Um, metabolic adaptation is what most people uh, know me for or associate me with, which makes sense. It's actually the first thing I published as a graduate student was a, a review paper about the topic. Um, so right now, I'm on a bit of a caffeine kick huh. uh, in terms of my research interests. Um, I think it's because there has been a lot of research coming out the last couple of months pertaining to uh, some new things about caffeine, um, looking at different, um, different aspects of dosing and potential sex differences and effects on soreness and recovery. So the caffeine literature right now is is kind of at a place where it is... Uh, exploring some new boundaries. Uh, with metabolic adaptation, it, it's certainly something that's always uh, always somewhere in my mind. But right now, the caffeine, I think, is most interesting to me. Uh, but this upcoming month for, for Mass, I'm actually about to start writing something, um, not, not for the October, but for the November issue, I think, about creatine. So if you ask me this question in three weeks, I'll probably say creatine. Perfect. Uh, I'm glad you brought up caffeine because I was going to ask um, a caffeine-related question for the beginning, even though that's not our main topic today. I had on Greg Potter, who is a sleep expert, recently on my podcast, and I asked this question from him, and he didn't actually look into it yet, and you might be able to answer this. So we, we all hear about the half-life of, uh, of caffeine, which might be you know five to six hours or so, and I asked him if there is such a thing as a quarter-life as well. So if let's say 100 milligrams of caffeine might be only 50 milligrams in your blood after you ingested it, then would it mean that it would be 25 milligrams 10 hours later? And does it scale linearly like that? 
what do you think or what, what do you know about this um i i don't believe the elimination kinetics are linear i i think it's uh um a non-linear relationship so i i think uh with caffeine, I'd have to look at, there are a, a series of very nice pictures that have kind of projected the elimination kinetics over several hours, but I'd have to go back and check those to see exactly what the shape of that curve is. Um, but but I, I would not feel comfortable without further evaluation saying that it is necessarily linear. Um, and, you know, another thing to keep in mind is that while the half-life information is useful and does give us a good general, um, a general place to start when it pertains to uh, caffeine timing. Uh, I, I would suspect that you don't necessarily need all of the caffeine out of your system to um, to say, okay, the effects of caffeine are essentially gone at this point. Um, and the reason I say that is some people that their ca- their caffeine intakes are so high and they drink it so consistent so consistently. I mean, realistically, they've probably n- it's probably been like two years since they fell asleep without some amount of caffeine in their yeah. system. <laughs> so I, I think um, I, I do believe it's a nonlinear relationship. But more importantly, I think that what we would use that information for is probably uh, not not what we would think, you know, so if, if the goal is to use some of that information to make further uh, granular assumptions about how far from say bedtime you need to remove it um i I don't know if the answer to that question necessarily lies in the elimination kinetics uh if if we're going to use it as like a one-to-one literal interpretation of needing all the caffeine gone yeah that is actually interesting uh that you say that because i i always wondered about what's that limit so let's say you're someone who is actually sensitive to caffeine and you're not one of those that can just down espresso shots before going to bed and can still fall asleep Uh, but you're actually someone like me who you know if i have caffeine too close to bedtime it will absolutely keep me up and even if i fall asleep it will be the most terrible night of sleep like what is that minimum or upper threshold of caffeine which i could still have in my system because i did notice before that if i have some meal with just a ton of cocoa powder for example on top then that would mess me mess with my sleep as well but if i just have a little bit then it wouldn't even though that still has some trace amounts of caffeine so probably there is some small amount that one can still have in their system and it would be interesting to see what that is but if if i could add one other thing um that brings up a great point of kind of differences between people Um, and and I know a lot of times it's like an easy cliche, uh, statement people throw out there so they don't have to commit to an idea. It's like, I don't know, everybody's different. Give it a shot. But when it comes to caffeine, like earlier, you mentioned like the half-life of caffeine, you know, you kind of were like, eh, you know, five, six hours, give or take. And yes, that, that is the mean, um, you know, when, when you start looking at study after study after study, most of them will be around that range, but you can find studies indicating that in some circumstances, the half-life is as short as two hours or as high as 10 to 12. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's like five to six is correct, but I, I usually think of it as more in the like three to nine range, you know, uh, to account for the fact that there is some very substantial variability when it comes to uh, caffeine elimination kinetics, but also just the sensitivity to the effects of caffeine. So, you know, we might look at two people, give them 200 milligrams of caffeine, or, or, or let's be even more thorough and say, we'll scale it to body weight. Uh, so we give both of them three milligrams per kilogram, just as a, you know, a number to throw out there. And even if their elimination kinetics are similar, it's very possible that their perceived responses, um, and even their physiological responses might differ um, to a meaningful degree. So the the thing with caffeine when it comes to, I also, I really love the fact that you brought up sometimes you can fall asleep. Um, sometimes people trick themselves into thinking it's a pretty vicious cycle because they're like, well, even if I have caffeine late, I still fall asleep. So I don't have sleep issues, but all throughout the day I'm lethargic and tired. So I have more caffeine and then I have caffeine late in the day, but I can still fall asleep. So it's not a caffeine issue. But then the next day, I'm still lethargic and tired and I have caffeine all day. And I, I don't think a lot of people consider the possibility that they are making their sleep really suck because they're having that late day caffeine. And they're kind of initiating this daily cycle of 
being so lethargic because their sleep sucked that they need caffeine late in the day and then they are further damaging the next day's likelihood of high quality sleep. So uh, even people who are like, I don't know, when I have caffeine, I don't have an issue falling asleep. I would encourage them to be very um, objective when they when they evaluate their sleep um, and, and try to figure out, um, even though I'm falling asleep, is it possible that um, that the sleep quality is still being affected in some way. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I would love to actually keep talking about this because this is, um, an interesting topic for me as someone who has had sleep issues for, for many years at this point. And it's something that I always kind of have to manage. So there's definitely a topic close to my heart. Um, and I also love caffeine to boot. So, um, definitely a, a cool topic to discuss, but let's get into something which also involves caffeine indirectly because usually it goes up the intake of caffeine as people start dieting. So uh, yeah, let's get into the metabolic adaptation stuff. And uh, maybe we can skip some of the very basic things. And I guess they will come up um, tangentially anyway. But in a general sense, I think um, we all know that um, as we start dieting, things uh, are starting to suck more and more incrementally uh, as far as our energy intake goes and how difficult it is to keep losing weight. Um, and we also seem to notice that some people have to just drop their calories by quite ridiculous extents. And we will bring up some specific examples that probably a lot of the listeners will be familiar with later on as we go on. But what accounts for the fact that uh, there is a bigger drop in the amount of calories that we have to eat to keep losing weight than what would be predicted just based on how much we weigh and how much weight we actually lose. Yeah, so the one thing I always like to uh, remind people of when I answer a question like this is that we, we've got several things that go into the amount of calories you're eating now and the amount of calories you were eating before. So a lot of times people look at their calories before they started prep while they were bulking look at their calories at the end of prep and say, wow, that is a huge change in caloric intake. Um, and so what usually accounts for that, certainly as you lose body mass, we expect that your energy needs are going to go down. Okay, so that's not adaptive. That's just the way things work. Um, but there are adaptive changes that happen and they happen in both directions. So that's another thing that contributes to this huge drop that we often uh, observe is that we look at somebody who's bulking, heavy, and they're uh, eating in positive energy balance. And so what we see there is th the body does respond to overfeeding in, in a way that is somewhat adaptive. Um, it varies a lot from person to person, but uh, for some people, it's not unusual to see their total daily energy expenditure increase by 10, maybe 15% when they are actively overfeeding. Um, now, to, to more directly answer your question, certainly when people start dieting, especially if they're dieting pretty hard, we will see the inverse of that. So their total daily energy expenditure might be reduced by 10 to 15 percent uh, compared to what it should be based on the size of their body. And so what we see is because of that adaptation that occurs in both directions, uh, some pretty remarkable changes in caloric intakes when it goes from the start of your diet to the end of your diet. But what's really driving those uh, adaptations as we diet, um, as we're, you know, pushing that diet further, and we're seeing that total daily energy expenditures going down, um, there is probably a small contribution that's related to resting metabolic rate. But m the larger contribution is from non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And that, that's the energy that we expend basically doing anything physical that's not structured exercise. Um, and what is dictating those changes, both as it pertains to resting metabolic rate and non-exercise activity, um, if, if you were to boil it down to a singular scapegoat that you wish to blame, it, the scapegoat would probably be leptin. Um, as we are either enter a caloric deficit or reduce the size of our fat cells, both of those inputs uh, lead to a drop in leptin levels in the blood. Leptin feeds back to the hypothalamus in the brain. And the, the hypothalamus is essentially the key brain structure that regulates a lot of things. But, but among those things uh, includes uh, behaviors related to 
uh, energy expenditure, feeding, and activity level. You know, the, the hypothalamus basically is the central structure that integrates all these feedback signals about your activity level, your energy intake, your energy expenditure, and, and then coordinates the response to those inputs. So that, that's kind of the general idea of what's going on. Awesome. Perfect. Um, am, am I correct in saying that people, like there's often the um, cliche of there are people with fast metabolisms and slow metabolisms. And am I correct in saying that it's not necessarily the basal metabolic rate of these people that vary that much? Like that is actually fairly well predictable based on just body weight, body mass. But this uh, adaptive nature of their metabolism is what's really differing between people. Like some people will lose weight easily and, and gain weight easily. And some people's body just likes to keep things the same. Uh, am I correct in saying that? I would say that's definitely correct. Um, during my PhD, I, I probably measured resting metabolic rate a few hundred more times than I would have liked to. <laughs> um, a lot of very early mornings in the lab. And, you know, usually if we want to guess somebody's resting metabolic rate, uh, we can do that pretty well based on some very basic um, objective measurements. You know, what's your age? What's your biological sex? What's your height and weight? Things like that. We can jam those into any number of equations and get a pretty good estimate of either their base, basal or their resting metabolic rate. There are slight distinctions between those two, but not worth going into at the moment, I don't think. Um, but yeah, we're pretty good at estimating that. The, the things that really separate people in terms of their total daily energy expenditure, which is really how people classify themselves as either being fast metabolism or slow metabolism. One key factor is just your your lifestyle. So total daily energy expenditure between two individuals uh, of where all other demographic variables are basically the same. Um, theoretically, I've seen papers suggesting that total daily energy, energy expenditure, uh, I'm sorry, non-exercise activity thermogenesis between two people, um, even if they're like the same body size and all that, it could vary by up to 2000 calories a day, just comparing like super sedentary people to super active people. That's the degree of variation that we see in non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Now, those, those are two extreme ends of that spectrum, but the point is there's a great deal of variability between how active your lifestyle is. Um, and then another thing, as you alluded to, is how responsive you are to overfeeding or underfeeding. And it's been well documented in the literature that responses are highly variable. Um, there are some people that if we overfeed them, and like I said, very clearly documented in several studies that really focused in on the variability. Um, if we overfeed somebody, it's, it's quite possible that they might have a pretty sizable increase in total daily energy expenditure in the, you know, in the ballpark of, you know, 10 to 15 percent. And what we find is those individuals are very resistant to weight gain uh, in the context of very deliberate, very well controlled overfeeding. So, you know, I think a lot of people make the assumption that whenever we see two people who respond very differently to overfeeding, it's because, you know, somebody's being dishonest about their intakes. And then the inverse is true for dieting. If we see that two people respond to a very similar dieting framework differently, we say, oh, well, somebody's been, you know, sneaking some snacks in. But in reality, there's a great deal of variability where some people, whether we're talking about overfeeding or underfeeding, some people have very strong adaptive responses in an attempt to defend their current body weight. Other people have very minimal uh, responses in terms of adaptation. And so if you start underfeeding them, they start losing weight, period. And if you start overfeeding them, they start gaining weight, like pretty much automatically. Whereas other people are, are a little bit more resistant. You start underfeeding them, they, they have a little bit of an adaptive process and they maintain body weight. You start overfeeding, same thing. And what's really critical to highlight is that none of this, none of it uh, is incongruent with the concept of calories in, calories out. Um, this is all perfectly in line with that. But what we're seeing is that some people are able to adjust their calories out subconsciously, not intentionally, in an adaptive way. And all that means is in order to continue the weight loss or the weight gain process, you have to adjust the calories in accordingly. 
Um, so a lot of times people get very concerned um, when I talk about metabolic adaptation, and that's never my intention. Um, the reason I bring up metabolic adaptation is, and the reason I write about it so much, is to make sure people are aware that uh, we cannot perfectly predict how you're going to respond to a diet without any prior knowledge. Mm. Um, you know, otherwise, there, there'd be essentially no reason whatsoever to have any kind of coaching or dietitian, <laughs> dietitian feedback on, on a diet. It's just like, oh, well, yeah, we'll give you a number and then you're off to the races. And sticking to that number is your choice. And, you know, maybe you check in with somebody just to keep you accountable. But w what I really like to make, make sure people are aware of is the fact that until we know where you are on that spectrum of responsiveness and, and adaptation, we're not exactly sure how high or how low your calories are going to be are going to need to be in order for you to meet your goal. But but I never want people to get the impression that if you have a highly adaptive metabolism that you're stuck, you know, so if you are a person who's has a pretty adaptive metabolism, and when we drop your calories, there's a great deal of adaptation, and your weight gain is less than expected, all we have to do is adjust that a little bit further. Um, it, it's not like your body is going to adapt and adapt and adapt and, and we just cannot induce weight loss. We just have to adjust the number a little bit and, and give you a nudge in the right direction. The only time that it becomes problematic is sometimes people have to go to a number that gives them a little bit of sticker shock, you know, where you say like, hey, I mean, if, if you want to get that lean, at your, you know, at your current body composition, this is kind of the calorie number we got to go with. Sometimes people see that number and they say, no way, yeah, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that makes sense. And so at that point, it's a choice. But I, I don't like, I don't like people to, th for people to think that there is an absolute barrier that they cannot overcome with that. It really just gets to a point where as the diet continues and you get leaner and leaner and smaller and smaller, especially if you're a smaller person in general with a low body weight, then we start to get to situations where the caloric intake that's required to continue inducing weight loss is just a little bit lower than some people are comfortable with. And I would never judge somebody for making that decision. You know, if, 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 if someone were to tell you, hey, this is the number of calories you got to you got to consume to make this happen, you either you basically have to make a choice adjust your calorie intake accordingly or adjust your goal to be more congruent with what you're comfortable with. Either of those options, those are both completely fine. Um, so it, it's not like a, hey, you got to be tough and, and starve yourself here. Um, but I, I just like to make sure people know before they get into a dieting process that responses do tend to vary. And that's not a, a cliche term. That's a science, you know, an evidence-based um, reality is that people adapt differently to different cal caloric intakes. And you might have to do more adjustment than you thought at baseline. And it might lead to some situations where caloric intake is pretty low. So for an example, sometimes when I work with my own clients, um, you know, they'll ask a lot of questions. I mean, because I exist in this fitness space, and a lot of people ask me about metabolic adaptation when I go on podcasts and interviews and stuff, I, I think that naturally makes a lot of people who are interested in metabolic adaptation more likely to apply to be one of my clients. <laughs> um, so I think I have a, a very biased sample of clients for sure. But I get a lot of questions of like, okay, so if you if you extrapolate this, how low do I have to go? W one of the examples I always like to bring up, I guess two of the examples. On our podcast, we recently talked to Eric Helms and Brandon Roberts. These guys are both, you know, PhDs in the field who are both competitive bodybuilders. And they know their stuff. They're not out there doing stupid stuff. And, you know, these are full grown adult men who at certain, it's not like they had to prep like this, the whole prep, but at certain stages in their prep, they were both in the, you know, around the 1400 calorie range for some amount of time. And, you know, I mean, Helms on stage, I think he's 80 kilos. Yeah. I mean, yeah. He, I mean, so he's not, he's not a small guy by any means. No. He's like six feet tall. He's, you know, muscular guy. And so, yeah, every now and then you'll get the 110 pound client who says, is it possible I might need to eat under, you know, 1300 calories a day? And I'm like, talk to Helms, man. <laughs> he weighs like, he weighs like, you know, 50 pounds more than you. And he's, and he's under that. So, or he's right around there. So, 
Um, yeah, sometimes intakes, especially as you start getting really, really lean and dieting really hard, they, they get a little lower than expected. And sometimes when bulking, they have to get a little higher than expected as well. Yeah, yeah it's funny you bring up Eric because I, I think I listened to a little bit too much of his uh, his talks and writings about his contest prep process. And I think I almost, because um, I just did a, a diet recently and I got really lean. And um, I think I almost no seaboat myself into thinking that, man, if Eric has to dig that much, there is no way I can eat this much and still lose. And I'm, I'm a similar size as he is. He is more muscular than me but um height wise similar and um, similar weight and i could I, I could not believe almost like man i can still eat like 2200 calories and, and still drop and this poor guy has to and, and he had to drop to like 1800 even when he was like 85 87 kilograms so it is it is just just crazy but before we because i want to get into his case study and also some some mm -hmm. people at the other end where they can diet on crazy high calories but you know like I kind of think that we can distinguish between people who can lose easily, gain easily. Uh, that would be me, for example. Like I, it doesn't take much of an overfeeding for me to just start gaining fat steadily. And I can just go up and up and up in body weight and my calorie intake will not have to change that much. And similarly, I don't have to dig that crazy hard to get from fairly chubby at times to very lean. Um, and then there are people who are kind of resistant in both, directions but or there are people who gain very hard but then they lose very easily like because because it sounds like it's kind of it's almost like it wouldn't wouldn't make sense if that was the case but is does that happen as well you know i'm not really certain what the research says about that um i would suspect that there's at the very least a pretty significant overlap where where the people who struggle to gain are also the people who struggle to lose or, or to phrase it a different way, the people who are more able to defend their body weight during high calorie times are, are probably also more more able to defend it during low calorie times. Um, but another thing to keep in mind is, you know, the way you you phrased it was that you can gain easily and lose easily. Um, but the thing that's weird is that I also feel as though I can gain easily or lose easily. But I also have a fairly adaptive uh, metabolism in terms of my, my total daily energy expenditure. And so what I mean by that is I've never struggled to undergo very large changes in body weight. It, it's really never been that difficult, um, but it requires very large uh, changes in caloric intake. So for example, um, I think within a year or two, between the ages of like 18 and 20, I did a very deliberate bulk, um, probably going from about 155 ish to about 195, um, which is a very large percentage of body weight yeah. to gain. And then, uh, there were times after I'd bulked up to 195 that I did a series of sequen sequential weight loss diets and eventually got under 140 again. Um, without, I mean, and this is like a, it's not like when somebody's like, on bed rest and they stop eating and they just atrophy to 140. I mean, this was a, a deliberate bodybuilding related cut. So I've always been under the impression that I can do it easily. But like when I'm dieting, my, my calories have to consistently, and I mean for months, uh, well, for a couple months, the last couple months of my diet, I'm, I'm pretty much, pretty much always under 1500 calories a day. Um, so I, I think that's a thing to keep in mind if people are listening and they notice that their that their metabolism is adaptive. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be hard. And I think one of the reasons that you, you could be a person who has a very adaptive metabolism but still finds weight changes to be easy, I, I think it's uh, it could be uh, related to neurophysiology or it could purely be related to psychology. But in any case, th those things that drive a person to really perceive that they're struggling, those just aren't there for me. And I would imagine there are many people like me as well, who even though our, our energy expenditure is quite adaptive in response to over or under feeding, we don't have the same uh, reward response psychologically to food. Um, like food for me, take it or leave it, I don't really care. 
I, I can certainly experience like a really great meal and be like, wow, that was incredible. Um, so it's not like I can't tell, but it's like if you told me like, hey, Eric, sorry, it's spinach, chicken and rice for the next six months, I'd be like, all right. I mean, at least cooking is going to be easy. So I, part of its psychology, part of it probably has to do with hunger regulation, which is it could be a neurophysiology thing as well. Uh, but for me, even when I'm dieting on, you know, 1400, 1500 calories, there might be a little hunger. But like when, when I do a 40 pound uh, weight loss for a bodybuilding prep and I get down to like, you know, I mean, you can look at my contest pictures on Instagram, Facebook, but I, you know, I get down to a, you know, five, six percent body fat, um, you know, lean enough to turn pro at least without a lot, <laughs> without a lot of muscle. <laughs> so, um, uh, even when I'm doing those prep diets and it's like a 40 pound weight loss, I don't really start dealing with hunger until I've lost at least 50 to 60 percent of the weight. You know, um, maybe the last 10, 15, 20 pounds, I have some degree of hunger. But my last prep, my I mean, my body was I was, you know, <laughs> if you go down the checklist of bodybuilding side effects, like I had it low test, low thyroid, the whole the whole deal. But the hunger never really showed up, uh, or at least not like this severe, severe hunger that people talk about. So if you notice that you have an adaptive metabolism, again, I, I really hope that people don't interpret that as like, well, sorry, you're stuck at your body weight, nothing you can do. Um, the thing that's really challenging is when people do have that adaptive metabolism, but they also have these other factors pertaining to uh, their kind of psychological responses to dieting, um, potentially their uh, neurophysiological responses where they're also backed up against those challenges of, you know, they miss the flexibility and they miss the ability to have the higher carb or the higher calorie intakes. Um, and they have really, really intense uh, hunger feedback that they're fighting through. I, I think there's there are other aspects to what constitutes easy weight loss and easy weight gain that go beyond just your energy expenditure adjustments. Yeah, what what you just mentioned about the subjective feeling of of struggling with with a diet that's that's really fascinating because I think when we discuss set points and settling points, some smart people like Menno Hanselmans, for example he would say that it doesn't really exist. It just, uh, there is energy expenditure, energy intake and body composition. And those things regulate your hunger and satiety responses. And the leaner you are, the hungrier you will become, no way around it. And the higher your energy intake, the more full you will be and in reverse as well. But things like this or like little details that people don't factor in, like people's psychology and just these individual responses that are very hard to, I mean, you cannot really measure this in a lab or something like that. You cannot really do uh, some sort of very direct study on this necessarily. And that explains like why some people just maintain a very lean physique, oftentimes on not high calories at all. So it's not like they have a crazy energy expenditure and they can just eat a ton of food and still stay lean, but they just food kind of like, eh, I can just take it or leave it. And yeah, I think the, the aggregate of these things can determine where someone will quote unquote settle. Yeah. I mean, when, when we talk about a settling point, um, you know, I, I don't want to like create any kind of straw man arguments to, uh, to bust apart. But I think if you take an overly literal interpretation and say body fat set point, it is what it is. You're born with it and it exists. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, has some major shortcomings um, because we do see people who are able to drastically change their body weight in either direction. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, you'll, you'll see instances of individuals who are very, very, very uh, heavy, you know, five, six, seven, 800 pounds and more. And you, you would suspect it's very unlikely that their, their true biological set point, you know, that was ingrained at birth was, was that high over, um, you know, what w would predispose one to a body mass index that high. Um, so it certainly seems that there are extreme examples where people can very much override what we would consider to be a typical, um, you know, working range of where a body fat set point would be. Um, 
And then again, so, you know, if you take it super literally, um, there are some challenges to that. But if you also disregard the concept entirely, I think there are shortcomings to that as well. Um, you know, we can certainly see instances where if you try to manipulate people's body weight beyond a certain working range in which they're comfortable, there, you know, there's some pretty measurable feedback to that. So I, I think the idea of like a body fat settling point is useful. Um, and I think it has to factor in biology, environment and psychology as well. Um, so again, I, I kind of just created two two ideas there that I, I don't think many people necessarily subscribe to the idea that, you know, the the setting point is like an ingrained biological fact that you're born with. Um, and then the other end of the spectrum being that there is no, no, nothing even resembling like a body fat set point or settling point. I don't know many people subscribe to either of those, but I, I, I would suggest that the, the reality is somewhere in the middle there where there certainly seems to be for any individual a workable range in which they're kind of at a homeostatic normal. And if we try to get them out of that range, we start to see measurable um, responses, both in terms of hunger, energy level, energy expenditure, a variety of hormonal responses. Um, so the, it, it would appear that everyone's got like a working range there. Part of what's setting that range is probably bio biological in nature. Part of it almost certainly also relates to the environment and the psychology surrounding their activity levels and their food intakes. Yeah, and and since we are on this topic, the the question always comes up: like, can you modify your set point? You know, like if you're if if you've always been the kid who had a difficult time getting to a six pack level leanness at least, and if you stayed there, you just found your, found yourself to be very food focused and and hungry, and you always tended to rebound sooner or later. Can you then become the person who can comfortably maintain a, a lean physique? And it's it's a very difficult question to answer because the answer is uh, yes, you can stay there physiologically, like you can definitely do it, but there's just so much behavior psychology, like probably. A lot of it has to do with just getting comfortable with a different lifestyle, making different choices. It's kind of a behavioral rewiring that has to happen. But there might be certain things which will always be difficult for you. But then again, habituation to pretty much anything can happen over time. So it's, it's a very interesting question. Hey, guys, just a second. Are you enjoying this podcast? If so, I'd really appreciate you dropping a five-star rating on the Sustainable Self-Development Podcast on iTunes. That will help me to grow this podcast, rank higher on the platform, and get more high-quality guests over time, which is a win-win for everybody. So if you could do this little bit of favor for me, I'll owe you one. Thanks a lot, guys, and let's continue. It's a concept that's extremely challenging, and uh, based on our track record, at a societal level, the idea of making very large, sustainable, and semi-permanent changes in body composition, our track record is not good. Um, when you look at the research on people who lose a lot of weight and then keep it off, you know, for very, very, very long durations of time, you know, most, most people from a st statistical perspective uh, do have some degree of regression to their formal, former body weight. Um, that doesn't always mean complete regression, um, but 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 there there are certainly a lot of factors that kind of pull us back to where we were. And as you were alluding to, I do suspect that a lot of that is habitual, behavioral in nature. I, I think it's it's really really difficult to completely alter the uh, the relationship a person has with activity level, with food intake. Um, it, it is it is a huge huge challenge that. Um, you know, when people talk about the weight loss research moving forward, um, a lot of people talk about different routes where people are looking for pharmacological interventions and things like that. I really think the the most promising stuff moving forward is going to be uh, behavioral in nature. How do we get people to adapt um, those, those habits and um, the way they interact with physical activity and food? And then, you know, if there are pharmacological interventions that come along that are like able to support that, um, certainly there, there's huge potential there. But, but I, I really think when it comes to losing weight and keeping it off, it is, uh, it's a substantial challenge that involves 
a, a really, really comprehensive change in habits. Yeah, since you brought up pharmacology, uh, you as a researcher and just a person who likes to think about interesting things and uh, think about them in interesting ways, do you ever think about what the future of uh, pharmacology and technology could bring to this? Like, will there ever be a supplement, for example, or, or a medication that will, like an actual calorie blocker, for example, that will actually block calories from being absorbed or something like that, or and, and certain other things which already kind of do exist, but are not yet at the stage where they can be applied uh, on a bigger scale, like uh, complete hunger turn off medication, like something that just literally makes you not interested in food whatsoever. Um, do you do you think about these things? I, I think there are some promising things potentially in the future. Um, I don't know of anything specific, but the, the other thing that's to keep in mind is that we have been trying for a while, but every breakthrough has, for one reason or another, come up somewhat short or had some major limitations uh, thus far. And so what I mean by that is like the idea of calorie blocking. I remember, um, you know, back in the day there were well, I, I guess let me make a more general statement. With calorie blocking, the question would be, where does the stuff go? And if we're trying to block that at the GI level, I would imagine that's going to be accompanied by some very unlikable consequences uh, in terms of GI distress. Mm -hmm. um, so I worry about that. Like, you know, they've, they've tried to do things with like uh, non-caloric fat substitutes and things like that, which just caused really unpleasant GI symptoms. And, and they were on the market for a time. And then everyone's like, honestly, I'd rather just get fat. <laughs> <laughs> like this, this is horrible. Um, so, so they promptly left the market. Um, I, th I think the things that I find most, oh, and another example is like something like, uh, like DNP where it's like the, the idea there was like, well, can we enhance energy expenditure? And the answer was yes, but in many cases to a dangerous degree. Um, and so again, there, there was huge limitations and uh, unfortunately a lot of, uh, a substantial number of people have died from, from taking too much DNP. So, um, you know, the, the pharmacology stuff is not an area I claim to have expertise on, but I kind of just sit in the, uh, in the audience and watch what kind of comes and goes. I think there is potentially, um, or at least I hope in the future, there, there might be some potential things where they can, um, intervene in a way that can help people when it comes to their hunger levels or maybe their reward sensations pertaining to, to food. Like maybe, maybe looking at certain, um, aspects of neurophysiology that could be safely, uh, modulated in a way that's going to help promote behavior change or at least facilitate that behavior change. But, you know, that, that is a completely non-expert, uh, wishful thinking kind of stance. So if, if there's like a neuroscientist out there who's like, oh, this Trexler guy is dumb as hell, you, you are correct. I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm not at all on the cutting edge of, of the pharmacological side of, of attacking this, this kind of obesity issue. But, uh, but w whether the long-term solutions end up being pharmacological or otherwise, I, I really just am hopeful that people, uh, get the help that they get the help that they want, um, to, to, to have more autonomy and more control over their health and their happiness and their well being. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we straight a bit away from uh, our topic here, but to get back on the metabolic adaptation stuff a little bit and the, the differences between people. Um, so if we look at someone like Eric that you mentioned, who is, you know, 80 kilograms when he is shredded, otherwise he is 85 to 90 kilograms, still six pack lean, and then 100 kilograms when he is not lean. Um, and he will have to go down to 1,400 calories. He had periods when he was only eating 1,200 calories. And is that then true? We look at some he had times where he was down at 1,200? Yeah, I mean, I think that was uh, five days at 1,200. And then... <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, yeah. It is... Uh... Um, it is crazy. Oh, man. And the craziest thing is that I actually tried. I, I tried doing some calorie cycling during this diet because, like I said, I could drop at like 2,200 or so. And I thought, you know what? I'll do three days at like 13, 1,400. And then I do four days at like 27, 28 or something. And by the end of those 1,300 days, 
it was almost entertaining to observe my own suffering. Like I've never seen myself like that before. Like I went on an evening walk because that was my only rule. I just want to keep my steps up. And man, the the way I was walking, it was like it was like a dead man walking, honestly. Like it, it must have looked funny from the outside. And when I sat down to make dinner for myself, I honestly I was starving, but I couldn't even bo- get bothered to make the dinner. I was just sitting there steering the pot like 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 a zombie. So I wonder how Eric was perceiving that, uh, because like you said, not everybody suffers equally on the similar amount of calories. But the reason I, I brought this up is because if you contrast that with someone like Alberto Nunez, who is smaller than Eric, shorter, less lean body mass, smaller overall body size, and he will finish a diet to get shredded at 3,000 calories. And I think I've heard you mention in a podcast and other people too, that you know, don't be envious of those people because they suffer just as much as you do at 1,200 calories if you have to go that low because at the end of the day, it's an energy gap that you're creating. So it doesn't matter what the absolute number is. But like some part of me just, I would just think that there has to be at least a difference in the absolute amount of food that you can eat, like just the length at which you can actually eat a meal and things like that. There, there must be an actual difference. Or could it actually be that Eric feels on 1,200 as Alberto feels at... 25? I mean, you could argue that maybe there is kind of a psychological or subjective difference. Um, But so like, for example, how you were talking about you felt like a zombie when you kind of replicated those super low calories. Um, Something to keep in mind is that, you know, as you said, your your energy expenditure is pretty non-adaptive when it comes to low calories. So uh, comparatively, you're probably suffering more. Um, if we're looking at just the pure physiology and the pure size of the energy gap. Now, you could argue, um, I think from a physiological perspective, everybody's pretty much squared up, um, whether, you know, they're in the, you know, the situations you described, whether you're on the Nunez side or the Helms side of the equation, you know, everybody's fighting against an energy gap. And as long as that energy gap is approximately equivalent and and body composition is approximately similar, they're going to be feeling pretty similar in general. Uh, Their subjective response to that may differ. Another thing to keep in mind is some people, (laughs) I remember back in the day, I had a buddy who was really into bodybuilding and his thing was he would use uh, tiny plates, tiny bowls, tiny spoons, Uh, So that when he was putting together his prep meals and he would look down and say, oh, my God, this plate is overflowing and I'm just putting spoonful after spoonful into my mouth. And it it was just because he he was literally using like the spoons you would buy for like a baby, like like to feed them baby food. And so I I think there there is probably there's certainly the, the possibility that some people, even if the physiology, even if the physiology across the board was was pretty similar in both circumstances. I'm sure that some people would look at, you know, a day of eating, you know, looking down at the tiny meal after tiny meal and inherently feel worse than than the person looking down at meals that are at least somewhat substantial in size. Um, but but I, I would expect that the difference is probably smaller than than a lot of people out there might think when you compare the two scenarios. The, the reason I say that is because a lot of people in the fitness space, they're like, they're like, oh, if I could just find the, you know, the magic formula that's going to allow me to prep on 400 more calories a day and get to the same body comp, like it might, maybe you find it and maybe it'll be fine, but it's not, it's not going to be as different as you think is my general uh, perspective on it. Yeah. And that is a very good segue into um, like what those magic formula things could be. Because there is obviously the energy expenditure side of all of this, which we can modify to some extent. Um, Anecdotally, I can tell that there clearly comes a point of diminishing returns. Like I can increase my daily step count from 10,000, which for me is pretty easy to get in just from doing my daily chores. Uh, to 15,000, which is, you know, requires some conscious extra activity, but it's not nothing crazy. If I do 20,000, it becomes a real drag really fast. And I, I frequently tried it. And then I concluded that, man, 
that extra bit of food that I get to eat, perhaps this way, it's hard to even track this, you know, very accurately, how much that actually is, but it's just not worth it. I would rather eat, you know, one or 200 calories less and just not have to find always extra minutes in the day to walk. Um, But like, what do you think, for example, it would take for someone like you to not have to eat 1500 calorie days, let's say if you really found that to be a, a big struggle, which you don't, as you mentioned, but what, what, what do you think it would have to be the game plan would have to be for you to eat, you know, 2000 calories a day and get to the same place? Well, um, I should preface this by saying certainly there is some hard limit, you know, there, there's going to be some limitation at which it's like at a certain point, the calories just have to get low enough. Um, but yeah, there's probably some little adjustments that, that you, you can certainly do things poorly that require you to eat less while prepping. And so if you address those strategies that are causing you to eat less than you, than you should be, then all of a sudden you're eating more than you have been, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, I, I, as you mentioned, I, I'm very much of the same opinion that like, the whole idea of doing more cardio to get a little bit more food has never seemed like a good trade-off for me. So when, even when I prep for bodybuilding, um, uh, I don't do any cardio. I, I I honestly didn't even... My most recent prep was when I turned pro and I made my, my pro debut. I didn't do any cardio and I didn't track step counts either. I just knew that I had to walk to work in the morning and walk home after. Otherwise, uh, I wouldn't get to work and I wouldn't get to sleep. <laughs> So, um, for me, that was the tracking I needed. I know where I'm going in the morning. I know where I'm going at night. And, uh, to me, that was liberating. It was low stress. It was repeatable. And yeah, like I said, that when you, when you consider the recovery burden of adding in a ton of cardio, I tend to get very hungry when I do a lot of cardio. And there's some research to show that that's a a fairly variable response as well. Some people can do a lot of cardio without a, a ton of hunger, I'm not that way. And there are others like me who we start adding significant amounts of cardio, our hunger starts to really, really go up. Um, so, but your, your question was, what are some of the things you can do? The idea that you can just kind of linearly continue increasing energy expenditure um, in perpetuity, um, there, there's challenges to that concept. So specifically what I'm what I'm getting at is there is some evidence to su- suggest that even outside the context of dieting, uh, there's some really cool research showing that when energy expenditure starts to get really, really, really high, it starts to actually get constrained. <laughs> so that there's almost like this kind of adaptive constraint of, of energy, total energy expenditure in people who are doing very, very high amounts of activity. Um, and so b- basically the, the body is pretty good at making sure that we're not going to starve to death or at least doing its best to fight that. It's not good at ensuring that, but it's it, it's pretty good at trying to help us not starve because that's kind of the most important thing that we could have ingrained into our genetic code. Um, but in terms of the things we can do, uh, certainly some degree of cardio can help you get a, a few more calories in. To me... I'm very comfortable with some cardio, but I'm I'm not very I'm not very adamant about the idea of leaning hard into like a ton of cardio as a weight loss mechanism. Um, but really, when I when I talk whenever I talk about metabolic adaptation, I talk about it pretty comprehensively because we're not just talking about a reduction in total energy expenditure. We're talking about a, a whole a whole slew of, like a whole milieu of of unfavorable things that happen. So we, we see, obviously, energy expenditure goes down, but we have to deal with changes in hunger, changes in sex hormones, changes in thyroid hormone change. There's a lot of stuff going on, uh, potentially the loss of lean tissue, which almost always is not what we're going for. Um, so when I talk about strategies to try to pragmatically attenuate metabolic adaptation, I'm looking at some of the other unfavorable things that happen as kind of downstream consequences uh, of metabolic adaptation. And so it really just becomes a list of general best practices for weight loss diets. And what that usually entails is being on a good progressive resistance training program, um, not going overboard with your cardio. Like I said, some is fine, but when you're doing a lot of heavy training and a ton of cardio, you're, you're very likely to train yourself into the dirt and probably exacerbate some of the issues as it pertains to, 
um, feeling lethargic, feeling just completely beat up, poor recovery, really high hunger, things of that nature. Um, when it comes to the diet, certainly you have to have enough fat in the diet to at least be somewhat supportive uh, of, you know, hormone production, um, essential fatty acid intake, the absorption of fat soluble, uh, vitamins. So I usually don't like to let people get below like 0.6 grams per kilogram of fat per day, even at the lowest. Um, you certainly need to be on, on a, a diet with sufficient protein, um, which usually is going to be somewhere in the 1.8 grams per kilogram and above for a lot of people. Um, and then what I try to do on a weight loss diet is sneak as many calories from carbohydrate as I can get away with. And one of the reasons I do that is because we, we notice that leptin certainly is responsive to the size of fat cells and how full they are. It's also responsive to short-term energy restriction. And it within that framework, it, it's particularly short-term carbohydrate restriction that, that seems to really cause a, a pretty meaningful drop in leptin. So I'm not saying that, you know, it's it's the key to preventing metabolic adaptation because it's certainly not. But um, I, I think it's theoretically the best we can do in terms of maybe hoping to make make the drop in leptin a little bit less. And also, it, it's a nice thing to make sure that we have uh, reasonably replenished glycogen stores from, you know, from training bout to training bout. Um, another thing that people try to do Oh, one of the very obvious ones I overlooked. Certainly, we don't want to be creating super huge deficits on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so theoretically, if you can extend your dieting timeline to, to allow for some more conservative uh, daily energy gaps, um, I think that would be ideal in terms of attenuating some of these effects of metabolic adaptation. And then finally, the one that's a little bit less certain um, there, there's been a lot of interest in the idea of using nonlinear uh, feeding strategies to attenuate metabolic adaptation. And what I mean by that is incorporating yeah. some periods of time in which you're actually not in an energy deficit. So the two most common applications of that would be um, short-term refeeds or slightly longer-term diet breaks. And so I think a refeed, when you look at the evidence that's available, which is admittedly, you know, we have a lot to learn about refeeds and how to optimize their use. I think it, it seems like you need to do at least a two day, preferably probably a three day refeed, um, which causes challenges if you're hoping if you're hoping to do it every week, because all of a sudden you're you're only dieting about half the time <laughs> if, if you're doing a, a three day refeed every week. Um, so you have to get really deliberate about how long to make those, how high the, you know, how high your caloric intake gets on a refeed. Are you going to maintenance? Are you going to a little above maintenance? Are you going higher? A another interesting strategy is the concept of slightly longer diet breaks, which are often one to two weeks long in the literature. And so there is uh, a big study called the Matador study that was very well done that made it look as though, you know, two weeks of dieting followed by a two week break where you're just eating at maintenance, not above maintenance. Um, that seemed to be a, a pretty suitable strategy. It, it seemed to attenuate um, some of the metabolic adaptation. It seemed to have slightly favor, slightly more favorable effects on fat loss in the diet. Um, you know, the nature of research is such that you don't want to, you don't want to say, hey, we found one study. So Glad we figured that out. Um, certainly, without question, there are going to be attempts in the next probably five or so years to replicate those findings and, and see how we can potentially optimize that approach. Um, one thing that I like to do as a coach is if I see somebody who, you know, if I have a client and it looks like we're really struggling, you know, it looks like we've got a lot a, a fairly adaptive metabolism or some of those unfavorable effects of dieting are, are seeming like they're starting to creep in changes in, you know, yeah. super lethargic sex hormone levels, libido, whatever the case may be. I think for now, until we have more research, maybe a, a conservative middle ground could be three weeks of dieting with a one week diet break that is at or just slightly above maintenance. Um, for me, I, I think that presents a nice middle ground because we know that 
at least the current evidence would su- would suggest that the the super short term like one day refeeds I, I don't think they're getting it done and two day refeeds still aren't doing anything particularly notable from the research we have available um, so I, I'm inclined to think that probably a week might be the sweet spot where you're spending at least more than half of your time dieting so that you actually get to the destination you're going to. Um, cause it, you know, it's not very helpful if you say, well, Hey, everybody just diet for one week and then take a three week break. And in 13 years, you're going to be lean. Um, that, that's, that's not super helpful to a lot of people. Um, so I, I think there's potentially a middle ground there where maybe it's, uh, you know, two weeks on two weeks off, but I'm hoping that three weeks on one week off is maybe, maybe a suitable middle ground. Yeah. Yeah, the the diet break stuff. Uh, I talked about it in a couple of videos and podcasts, and it's a um, it's it's a bit of a contentious uh, t- topic for me, mainly for like the adherence, uh, lo- logistics, and and just whether it's worth it. Like for example, if I was to go from fifteen percent body fat to ten, you know, I I might suck up a bit more metabolic adaptation and and <laughs> whatever uh, just to get to there efficiently and as quickly as possible, and then. The times at which I would spend doing diet breaks, I can actually start getting out of the diet and, and reversing back. But that's that's kind of um, a whole separate discussion. What what I would be interested in, uh, but but certainly someone who is prepping for a, a competition, you know, and getting to unquestionably unsustainable levels of leanness, a uh, whole different discussion. So uh, no disagreements there. But what what I would li- love to ask your opinion about is kind of the reverse almost of a diet break, and that is like doing basically cramming the deficit into one or two or basically less days than on which you're actually dieting. So instead of having a linear uh, reduction in calories on all days, cramming it into very aggressively into one or two days, kind of like almost like an alternate day fasting kind of style where you might have one or two super low calorie days, but the rest of the days you can actually eat normally. Like maybe you could quote unquote trick the body a little bit by, you know, because you're only spending those little little amounts of time actually dieting, those metabolic adaptations might occur a little bit slow, slower than they normally would. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, as you were starting the question, the thing that came to mind was the same thing, kind of the the alternate day fasting or the, um, the you know, in the research, they call it intermittent fasting. Um, the, the idea of having either every other day or a couple days placed somewhere throughout the week where you're having essentially either no calories or, you know, up to like 25% of your normal calories, which would be, you know, a very significant deficit. Um, I am generally open to the idea that those may be as effective as a linear approach. Um, I think if you look, there's probably, I I think there are about three meta-analyses that look at various approaches to these alternate day fasting type of interventions. Generally speaking, they don't show meaningful benefits beyond a normal dieting approach. Um, So I'm not adamant about the idea that they would be better. Um, I think for some people, they could certainly make sense. I I wouldn't uh, throw it out entirely. Um, it, it would be one of those things where certainly on the super low calorie days, those almost certainly have to be your off days from training. Um, you know, that, that's one of the big concerns with me is making sure that's planned very deliberately so that you are able to still go into your training bouts in a good place physiologically. Um, you know, so you would have to deliberately choose which days are fasting days so that obviously you're not training on them, but even, you know, Except if you're Eric Helms, <laughs> on which all days are fasting days sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, but, but, you know, you wouldn't want to train during it. I, w- I think that's a safe thing to say. But you would also have to be pretty cautious about, like, do you really want to train a heavy leg session the day after a full fast if you have, like, one meal? Yeah, yeah. You know, if, if you've had one small meal going into that leg session, are you really prepared to implement the type of, of training stimulus that you're probably going to need to be reaching your, your body composition goals? So what, what I'm getting at is 
it really depends on what exactly is the performance objective of the dieter. If the whole thing is like, hey, I'm kind of a recreational lifter. Uh, I'd like to get slightly leaner, but I'm not stepping on stage. My performance is just kind of a means to an end so that I look fairly fit. I'd be a lot more open to using alternate day fasting for that type of client than for a client who says, hey, my performance in the gym is pretty critical to me and I'm trying to get absolutely shredded, but I don't want to lose muscle. I'd, I'd be a little bit more nervous about applying that approach. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. And other issues too, like, and then if they are on your rest days, then in some people it could induce like a mild form of like exercise bulimia. Mm. It's like, okay, so if I don't train, I starve, which can lead to other issues too. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a tricky one to manage for sure. That, that's a good point. Um, certainly one I should have mentioned. Uh, and, and that's something with my clients that I'm, I try not to, I try not to reinforce that idea. So like, a lot of times people will say, hey, when you have a client, how much do you reduce their calories on off days from the gym? And I say, I don't like, you know, over the week, it'll average out, we'll be fine. Um, but, you know, I, I don't like to get into that, um, that idea of today's training is going to influence how much we get to eat today. And like this yeah. hour by hour approach to energy balance. And even on deloads, I, I don't like to make huge adjustments. Uh, the only thing that I, I will say is like, if I've got a client and I'm like, you know what, they're probably ready for an increase in calories, but we are literally starting a deload like in two days, I'm probably not going to ramp up their intake rolling into a deload. Um, I'll just save it for a week and do it the next week. But but I, I, yeah, it's a really good point. I don't like to reinforce that kind of uh, viewpoint. Yeah, yeah, I do the same. I, I sometimes offer it as an option when someone wants to drop fat or someone claims that they are super hardcore about their progress. I say, look, you can implement this. You can drop your calories by this amount and you can partition more, but it's up to you. And if they say, no, nah, to be honest, I don't want to dread my rest days. I'm, okay, fair enough. You don't have to. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I certainly, I'm not against the the concept, but I, I think people should should certainly be um, thoughtful about how, how is this exact specific client going to internalize this message? Absolutely. And if, if it's somebody who's not, not at risk of thinking, okay, now we're swapping exercise and the reward is food and, and you, you're not going to induce, you know, that kind of exercise bulimia perspective that you mentioned, then, then I have no issues with it just to be clear. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. Agreed completely. Um, so for, for closing, let's uh, touch a little bit about what to do after the diet is is over. So um, first of all, do you think there is any value in staying? Um, let's assume that you're not, you know, 5% body fat and you're on the brink of dying. And <laughs> if you stuck in traffic for a couple of hours, then um, you're, you could be actually risking passing out. So you're not at that spot, but you were, you got to your desired leanness and now it's time to make a change. And your goal is, let's say, to start a lean bulking phase, start putting a muscle. So you want to go into a small surplus. Do you think there is any value in staying there for a little bit for things to stabilize? I don't even really know what that means, but I hear that a lot from some people. So what do you think? Well, that's a good question. Um, so theoretically, if you're getting to that type of body fat where, you know, theoretically this is supposed to be sustainable, you know, if, if this is the body fat that you had in mind as like a walk around everyday body fat, um, it really shouldn't take much to get into the positive energy balance status where you're able to gain lean mass in a, you know, in a reasonable rate of time. The thing I would, uh, the thing I would certainly be cautious of is the fact that, you know, we, we've done some research in my lab and uh, some of my colleagues have done research as well. When we look at, for instance, a bodybuilder or a physique athlete that goes into a contest preparation and what happens in the, the weeks following it seems very challenging to add significant amounts of lean tissue. Um, there's going to be an increase, an initial increase in those folks in water weight, glycogen, sodium. That, there's kind of an initial bump in what registers as lean mass, but isn't really lean mass. It, it's just fluid shifts. But in the first you know, month or two following these types of diets, it looks like there is potentially preferential addition of fat mass. And I know you're thinking, well, that's in bodybuilders, but we're also, you know, something to keep in mind in these studies is 
when you look at a sample of uh, local natural physique sport competitors, that doesn't mean everybody's 5% body fat. Yeah, yeah. You know, go, go to a local show <laughs> and go, go look at who's competing in, you know, not just bodybuilding, but men's physique, uh, figure, bikini. And you're going to see people who do represent in some cases, what you're talking about, which is getting to a lean but not deathly lean physique and then reversing out of it or, or building from there. And so the only thing I, I, I caution people about, I'm not trying to push this idea that you add like three carbs a month for the next 35 years, but at least be cautious of the fact that you need to be or you sh theoretically should be matching these increases in caloric intake with uh, a sufficient training stimulus to promote muscle growth. And so, uh, you know, the super aggressive back in the day, when, you know, when I was first getting into bodybuilding, everybody was like, Oh, the second you stop dieting, you're primed for muscle growth. And you should be like force feeding calories because your body's ready to grow. Um, now the more research we've done on the topic, it seems like that only pertains to the, the fat cells, like they're ready to grow. Yeah. Um, so you just want to be, um, I'm not, I don't want to give anybody like, um, uh, significant reservations about like, oh, I guess I just have to stay on super low calories forever. But, uh, you know, theoretically, if you're getting to a sustainable body fat that you intend to keep, it shouldn't be that horrible of a caloric intake anyway. Um, but you, you, you certainly, as you transition to a lean bulking phase, you should not be in a deficit. That's for sure. Um, but but I, I would say you want to be in a small uh, caloric surplus that causes a realistic rate of weight gain. And what I mean is if your rate of weight gain is not similar to what you would consider a realistic rate of lean mass gain, then it's probably not lean mass, Yeah. Uh, especially coming out of an extended dieting phase. So you just want to be you want to be objective, you want to keep an eye on things and, and be realistic and say, you know, if it looks like you're rapidly putting on some fat, then maybe you need to adjust the caloric intake and make sure that you're providing a sufficient training stimulus. But you really have to titrate the 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 rate at which you start increasing calories. And that that doesn't mean you need to do you need to stay at the same body weight for eight months before you start gaining any lean mass. But it does mean you should at least keep an eye on whether or not you seem to be preferentially like only gaining fat or, or gaining fat at a, a accelerated rate. Yeah. Um, now, as you know, Eric and his colleagues at 3D Muscle Journey have promoted the recovery diet, which is entails a very aggressive but not ludicrous amount of weight gain very uh, right after the show. So after you finish dieting, you're at that crazy low body fat level and you get into the largest surplus that you will ever have over the course of a reasonable bodybuilding journey and you will purposefully gain fat mass back because there, there's just no reason to be shredded if you're not on stage and let's just go up to a reasonable body fat percentage, maybe something like 8 to 12% body fat for guys, let's say. And from then on, slow things down a little bit more. Now, that makes a lot of sense. Like if someone is just not interested in, you know what, I'm kind of fed up with not having any libido and thinking and dreaming about food all the time. But if someone says, you know what, I don't mind that. I want to take it really slow and I want to take advantage of each step of the progression back towards a higher body fat. Do you think there is any significant harm in taking it as slowly from the get-go from even as lean as maybe five, six percent body fat, as if you were starting from, you know, nine percent body fat or eight percent body fat. Um, so I have a figure, um, an image in a, an article that I wrote. It's uh, if you go to strongerbyscience.com slash metabolic dash adaptation, I put mm -hmm. a figure in there. And one of the things I wanted to talk about in the article was you know, reverse dieting and recovery dieting and, and where each would apply. Because I, I don't necessarily see the concepts as mutually exclusive or well, I, I don't see them as a dichotomy. I, I see them more as a spectrum of approaches. And so what I have in the, um, in the article is a figure showing a, a series of characteristics that would favor a fast rate of fat gain after a competition or weight gain. And then I have a series of characteristics that would be that would lead you to believe that maybe you should take a slower rate of weight gain uh, following the end of your diet. 
And again, the, these are basically tailored toward people who are getting pretty lean. But, you know, people who might want to gain weight faster after a diet, these are people with, you know, persistent side effects from dieting. So you mentioned, like, I'm sick of being tired and hungry and having no libido. Um, people who are nowhere near their genetic limit for muscularity or, you know, people who are not near their where they want to be in terms of where they end up in muscularity. If you still have ambitious goals for significant muscle gain in your lifting career, you probably want to go ahead and get back to a spot where you, you, you're going to be able to gain a decent amount of muscle. Staying super lean forever is not going to be conducive to that. Um, and, you know, th there's, there's a whole cluster of other characteristics, but to summarize them and not just read a list of stuff, generally speaking, you have to consider what the individual's goal is. Now, if you're at a body fat that you want to maintain long term, um, and you're not having serious side effects, um, you're feeling pretty good, maybe not perfect, but you're feeling pretty good. You know, in those scenarios, I think it does make sense to take a somewhat slower approach. You certainly shouldn't be in a deficit. Like the, the day that you have that you've decided the diet's over, you should at the very least be in a small caloric surplus. The question is, how big does that need to be? And ultimately, it's going to depend on the lifter's goals. And it's going to depend on their current status of how they're feeling in terms of, I feel like crap, I need to recover. And one of the things I would love to make progress on in the future is I'd really love to see a way that we can help people take control of this post-competition period and facilitate recovery without needing to gain a ton of fat back. But for, from the evidence we have now, it certainly would appear that some degree of fat regain looks to be an important factor facilitating recovery. I wish it wasn't the case, but it is. So I, I think that the recovery diet premise has a significant uh, benefit, and, and it is supported by the evidence that would suggest that if, if you have some idea that you're going to stay really, really shredded, but somehow recover from this diet by slowly increasing calories without fat gain, right now the evidence would suggest that's extremely unlikely to happen. And so I, I think that one of the really positive things about shifting the focus from ultra controlled reverse diets to um, recovery diets that include fat gain as part of the plan, you know, there there is evidence to suggest that to some degree getting to a fairly normal uh, body fat level is important. However, I, I do want to say the rate of fat gain does matter. I, I, I don't think it's the same thing to gain it all back over three weeks versus three months, because what we see is that some of the, uh, so to get specific, hyperphagia or the, the super extreme hunger that a lot of people experience toward the late phases of a diet, hyperphagia appears to be linked not only to the loss of fat mass, but also the loss of lean mass. And that response doesn't seem to be really alleviated until we restore the lean mass that was lost. Um, the mechanism describing that relationship or explaining it is not fully elucidated, but there is evidence to suggest that this is a real relationship that even if you restore that fat mass extremely rapidly, if you have not restored the lean mass fully, that hyperphagia may persist to some degree. Um, so I, I think there's value in regaining fat, certainly, but regaining that fat, uh, concomitantly as you're regaining lean mass so that you, you have an overall restoration of not just some of the fat mass that was lost, but also the lean mass as well. Because my concern is if you say, I'm going to be really uh, adamant about recovering and restore my fat mass extremely rapidly, and it's way quicker than you could possibly hope to restore a lot of the lean mass that was lost, um, you could be setting yourself up to a spot where you're like, okay, so I've gained a ton of fat and certain aspects of recovery are are happening, but I'm still very, very, very hungry and still very inclined to overeat. That that would be my only, um, and, and I, I don't think that, I, I wouldn't suspect that Helms or any of the, the 3DM, 3DMJ gang would necessarily disagree with that. Um, but but it's it's an important caveat to keep in mind if if you're viewing it as a dichotomy of like, either regain all the fat immediately or refuse to regain any, um, the, the, the real solution is going to lie somewhere in the middle there. 
Yeah, and just to clarify, and then we're going to wrap up in a minute because I was quite abusive of your time, uh, which I realized, but uh, I, I did not mean that dichotomy at all. What, what I actually meant was, I mean, during any lean bulk, as lean as it's going to get, you're going to gain some fat. Like even if you're yeah. starting from 12% body fat you might, and you're taking it very slow, you might be in 150 to 200 calorie surplus, let's say. You know, over the course of many months, you will gain fat. It's just going to be slow. So, and, and that's what I meant, like, would that make sense even when you are at, least, let's say, 6% body fat and really take your time to get back up to 8 and then to 10% body fat? Or or should you go more assertively if you're that lean and going to like a 500 calorie surplus to get there a bit faster? That's what I meant. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, you know, I, I would view it as kind of a non-linear kind of approach to weight gain where there's kind of a steeper slope at first where you're just getting closer to the body fat that you're comfortable sustaining long term. So there, there's maybe a slightly more rapid rate of weight gain right out of the gate. And then things really kind of smooth off and, and flatten out once you're at a body fat where you're like, okay, I'm still lean where I like to be. Um, I don't want to get any, any more fat than this. Um, and now it's time to really uh, tighten things up and make sure that a huge proportion of the additional weight gained is in fact lean mass. So you don't want to keep yourself in that, in a spot where you're so lean that you're delaying, you know, physiological recovery from any side effects that might be present from the diet. You certainly want to get out of that range in a pretty expeditious manner. But once you're out of that range and you're kind of in that safe zone where you're still lean and you're comfortable and you're ready to really tighten things up, then that the slope of that weight gain line should get, uh, probably significantly flatter absolutely makes makes total sense uh well uh, eric uh we covered pretty much everything uh pretty much not everything everything but uh it was a lot of fun talking to you and um yeah we went on a couple of tangents which i think were super interesting and i want to thank you for taking the time today and uh, i'm i'm 100 sure that people will dig it a lot so uh please let people know where they can find out everything that you've got going on and all the resources that um, you would like them to check out. Yeah. So the, the best place to get in touch with me is Instagram. And my handle is at Trexler Fitness. Uh, I'm also on Twitter and Facebook, but I don't use them a ton. And to stay on top of the work we're putting out, uh, strongerbyscience.com. We have articles all the time and we've got uh, a podcast that comes out every Thursday, which you can find on pretty much any podcast platform. And then every month we come up with the uh, with Mass, the our monthly research review with uh, Greg Knuckles, Eric Helms, Mike Zordos, and me. Uh, so that's where you can find me. Perfect. And tomorrow is a happy day because you have your new podcast episode, which I'm looking forward to. So uh, yeah, Eric, thank you so much for taking the time today. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you for having me. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, then please, once again, consider dropping a five-star rating on iTunes. It would mean a lot to me and it would be truly helpful. And if you're interested in more cool stuff, then you could visit my YouTube channel. If you type in Sustainable Self-Development Podcast there or even SSD Podcast, it will come up. And if you're interested in working together with me, then you can check out the Calendly link in the show description. There you can book a free call with me. We can hop on that call, chat about your goals, challenges, determine if we are a good fit. And if that is the case, then we could be working together going forward to get you to the results that you want. So that's all I had to say for today. I hope you enjoyed this once again. And with that, see you next time.